أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا داود إنا جعلناك خليفة في الأرض فاحكم بين الناس بالحق ولا تتبع الهوى ولا تتبع الهوى فيضلك عن سبيل الله <تصفيق> إن الذين يضلون عن سبيل الله لهم عذاب شديد بما نسوا يوم الحساب وما خلقنا السماء والأرض وما بينهما باطلا ذلك ظن الذين كفروا فويل للذين كفروا من النار أم نجعل الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات كالمفسدين في الأرض أم نجعل المتقين كالفجار رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم به نستعين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Respected elders and brothers, mothers and sisters, our beloved viewers at home, Alhamdulillah, we started doing the tafsir of Surah Asad a couple of weeks ago. Today, inshallah, we will continue from the 26th verse of uh, the surah, inshallah. So, last week, if we can recall and recap a little quick, we were talking about how Allah Azza wa Jal was using the story of Dawud alayhi salam to comfort him. That the Prophet ﷺ, he was being rejected and denied and accused of many things, which were false, obviously. And so similarly, Allah uh, was telling the Prophet ﷺ that you're not the only one. Prophets before you went through similar situations. Okay, And whenever we see other people in a similar situation, we don't feel as bad as before. Like, oh, they went through it too, so I should just get over it. Or like sometimes people will say, why is school so long? To go to college and take classes that don't even have anything to do with in real life. When am I going to ever apply this? But when they realize that other people took the same route, took the same tests and same classes, then they're like, you know what, I just have to do it too. Right? So we were in that story of Dawood alayhi salam, where there was a lapse uh, in the decision of Dawood alayhi salam and Allah azza wa jal, uh, reprimanded him and reminded him of his status and of what is required and expected of him. So we are still in that uh, part of the, of the incident. Allah Azza wa continues to tell Dawood alayhi salam, Ya Dawood, inna ja'alnaka khalifatan fil ard. That, oh Dawood, and Dawood is David in, in English. So, oh David or Dawood, indeed we made you the khalifa. Khalifa means someone who is a successor, who comes after another person. That's a Khalifa. Comes the word Khalaf. فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ اللَّهُ الصَّلَىٰ So we made you the Khalifa, the successor. And your job is not to pick anyone's side, but to be a fair judge. فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ So judge between people in truth, يعني, with justice. And Al-Haq is justice. Um, so, وَلَا تَتَّبِعِ الْهَوَىٰ And do not follow your desires. فَيَضُلَّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Because then it will end up misguiding you from the path of Allah. So one thing we can pick up from right here, this portion of the verse, is that when a person follows his hawa, his nafs, his, his desires, then what happens? That is one of the reasons for him to be misguided from the path of Allah. Okay, what is just to make a mistake and follow it one time? But tattabi al hawa, you constantly keep on following your desires. Okay, uh, when you keep on pursuing and going after the wishes of your desires, then that becomes a reason for a person to uh, be misguided from the path of Allah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَضِلُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ بِبَا نَسُوا يَوْمَ الْحِسَابِ Indeed, those who are misguided and go astray from the path of Allah, then for them is obviously adabun shadid, a severe punishment. Bima nasu yawm al-hisab, because they have forgotten the day of judgment. So, 
What leads to being misguided from the path of Allah? When you follow your desires. And what happens when uh, you follow and get misguided? Then you, there's a severe punishment. And then Allah says another reason why people get misguided from His path is is because they forgot the day of judgment. And when you forget about something, you don't work for it. Right? That's why, and I keep giving example of students because I'm always dealing with students. But you know, students tend to forget their assignments, their homework, their exams, their tests. So you got to keep on reminding them. Because if they forget about it, they're not going to work for it. If you keep on reminding them, they will get some sense that, hey, test is coming up in a week or two. I got to start preparing. But if they forget about it, they're not going to study for it. But similarly, Allah says, for them, what else can there be? They were misguided. And part of the reason was they followed their hawa and they forgot the day of judgment. And all of that led them to being misguided. And thus for them is uh, a severe punishment. وما خلقنا السماء والأرض وما بينهما باطلا ذلك ظن الذين كفروا فويل للذين كفروا من النار. So these people they forgot the day of judgment. You know, thinking that all this stuff that in front of us, the world, the sun, the moon, everything is created just for no reason, باطل, aimlessly, for no reason, no purpose behind it. Allah says, no, no, no. ما خلقنا السماء والأرض وما بينهما باطلا. We did not create the heaven and earth in vain, aimlessly, for no reason. We created it for nothing. And if you ask the scientists and the doctors and people who study the human body and the anatomy and the physiology of the body, they will tell you that everything that happens in the body has a reason. Even the way an organ or a tissue looks, it's supposed to complement what it does. And there's this uh, thing called in science that complementarity of structure and function. Meaning you have an organ, it has a, a certain shape, a certain way it looks. And the look it has, it perfectly fits the function it's supposed to do and provide for a human being. So even down to the way it looks, it has a reason, there's a point behind it, right? But then they think they themselves are created for nothing, for no reason, right? It is a clear uh, contradiction of what they preach and how they... Uh, move on with their lives, right? Allah says, ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا That is just the thinking of those who are kuffar. They don't believe, they disbelieve in Allah and the judgment. That is their thinking. It's just a dhan, assumption, right? And in the dhanna la yughri min al-haqqi shay'a And dhanna shamsan does not avail anything against the truth, right? That's why we are also uh, warned to not uh, assume things about people. So woe will be to, the, to those who disbelieve from the fire, from the fire of Jahannam. And this is very uh, dangerous thinking, thinking that everything just came about and the natural way of things, maybe we were apes before and it just happened that we became human beings and it's all an incident. This is dangerous thinking, right? You think Allah has all cured everything for just bottle, aimless? Or do they think that Or do they think that they can do whatever they want here and then Allah Azza wa Jal will treat everybody the same? Those who believe and those who are mufsideen. Everybody is equal to Allah. Do you think that? Do they think that we're going to deal and interact with the muttaqeen like the fujjar, the wicked people? What do you think? Everything is just a game? Allah obviously... This is the, the answer to this question is no, never, no way. In this world, you will see that sometimes the valim, the oppressor, he's living a good life, right? And the mavroom, he is living a very bad life. You think this, that's it, just like that, it's over? Yani there is no afterlife and there is no resurrection where everything will be put into place, everyone will be paid back for what they did? You know what kind of aqal people have? Tayy. كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبر آياته وليتذكى أولو الألباب. But these same people, the Quraysh of Mecca, to them, to whom the Quran was being revealed at the time, they are these people, obviously, who think like this. So if they were to just listen to the Quran that's being revealed to you and just ponder over it just a little bit, their hearts would have wakened up. 
Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka. This is a book Allah says which we reveal to you. Some of the feature of this book is Mubarak, is blessed in all different ways. In every possible way, this Quran is, is blessed. Right? If uh, it's it's a book of guidance, it has that's a kind of barakah, right? It is a guide to what is right, by which people uh, live their lives, they fix their lives. The recitation of the Quran is beautiful. The words of this Quran can have so many different explanations. So much can be expounded and taken out and stretched from these words of the Quran. Right? You know, from the beginning of time uh, of the, of the Prophet they were they started writing the fasir of the Quran, explanation of the Quran. And until this day, we still have scholars who are still writing the tafsir of the Quran. And it's not going to come to an end. The more people think about the Quran, the more barakah will come out of the Quran. It's a shifa for what is in the in the heart, for the diseases of the heart. It gives cures. So it's mubarak. Kitab anzalnahu ilayka mubarak. Why is it mubarak? ayati. That they might reflect, ponder over the verses of the Quran. And once you ponder, then what happens? albab. And the people of Alba, people of understanding, they would be reminded. So in order for us to be reminded by the Quran, we have to ponder over it, think over it, really, really sit there and try to really uh, seek out the meanings either by ourselves or by uh, sitting with the people uh, who, can, who can elaborate on the verses of the Quran. So the problem with these people of, of, of Quraysh, what happened? And they saw the Quran being revealed and they saw the miracle of the Quran in front of their eyes. But the problem, they did not do tadabbur. They did not contemplate and ponder over the Quran. Quran? Do they not think over the Quran? Or are the hearts of these people locked? So in order to unlock your hearts, you have to do tadabbur of the Quran and that's how we will get reminded. All right. Now, now going back to Dawud alayhi salam, Allah says, وَهَبْنَا لِدَاوُدَ سُلَيْمَانِ نِعْمَ الْعَبْدُ إِنَّهُ أَوَّلُ Allah says, we gave, we granted, we gifted Dawud Sulaiman. One of his sons was Sulaiman alayhi salam, who was also a prophet. And the other, some of the other uh, religions, uh, they don't believe that Sulaiman alayhi salam was a prophet. And that's why, they attribute and say a lot of things about Sulaiman Islam that is not befitting a prophet. So, um, if we ever come across those stories, we should avoid uh, such stories that do not fit a prophet of Allah. You know, they will say very th things that sometimes is, I, you, you can't even talk about a regular person like that, but they lose all respect and say things that have no basis in terms of authenticity. So Allah says, Ni'ma al-Abd, what an excellent servant Sulaiman was. Innahu awab. He repeatedly, continually, continuously used to come back to Allah Azza wa just like his father. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, they say. And Dawud alayhi salam, just like we read before, he made a mistake and khalas, he accepted and he returned turned back to Allah Azza wa Similarly, we will see another thing about Sulaiman alayhi salam where he makes a mistake and he turns back to Allah azza wa jal. So I mean you can see a theme that's being repeated in these verses is that hey you make a mistake, you, you screw up or you do something wrong as a human being, you will do it. Turn back to Allah azza wa jal and admit your mistake. You know that's, we all uh, face these issues and we all go through these emotions, ego and pride, inflated egos, right? Uh, the best thing to do, Allah, is when you make a mistake, ha, just, just own up to it that you did something wrong. But sometimes we make things worse by not accepting and acknowledging uh, that we did something wrong. So when did Sulaiman uh, what happened? So again, in this, according, in this incident, there's a lot of different variations and you will hear other things people say. But the one that's closest to this story is that Sulaiman alayhi salatu was salam, one time after Asr he was uh, inspecting and looking over and uh, you know just 
uh, passing by the horses that belong to him. And you know, people, horses, sometimes something that people used to be proud of. Even nowadays, you look at the royals of certain countries, they're very passionate about their horses. They know a lot about their horses and they'll buy the horses for millions of dollars. So, Sayyidina he was just inspecting, looking, and, and seeing his horses. And the horses were brought to him in the afternoon. What kind of horses? As-Safinat. Very um, poised or standing. Safinat literally means when the horse is four-legged, right? It's standing on four legs, and one of the legs is a little bent, and it, and it looks very nice in pictures when one of the legs of the horse is uh, 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 bent inwardly. It probably shows that the horse is very healthy and strong and is just itching to start running, right? So Safinat and al jihad they were very fast horses. They were just waiting to get released and go with uh, with their master straight. Even if it was a battlefield, they would go. And so you can see, you know, how a person could be attached to their horses because a person horse is willing to give his life for the master. Right? So they build a very close relationship, even with camels, subhanAllah. I know one time uh, we were in, in Saudi, we were passing by this place, you know, it was like a recreational place, and this this brother, Sudanese brother, he had a he had a big camel and he was taking it around for people to ride it. And we were very scared to go because it's such a huge beast. But he was just laughing and he's like, This is my baby and I grew her up and I fed her and I did everything and they have such a, a synchrony and harmony uh, in their give and take relationship and they build such a good relationship with their with their camels so similarly horses uh, so what happened is the whole story is not mentioned in the Quran and perhaps there is a wisdom behind it Ibn Uthaymin says Allah did not give us the details of what happened we should not speculate as to what really happened, right? But what uh, what, what Mufasirun have said, and what is what, what looks like that everyone accepts, is that he what he got distracted by uh, his horses, and he missed Salat al Asr, right? Because uh, he was just busy with his horses, and so when he realized that he missed Salat al Asr, he said, "Bring these horses to me. Ruduha alay. Bring them back to me." He started striking Mas'han and Darban. He started hitting them, striking, not hitting like abuse, but he started um, slaughtering them by their necks and by their legs. Uh, he started slaughtering them and then he gave it out in the path of Allah. So this was not something like, oh, hey, he's wasting his wealth and he's doing this and that. No, he gave it in the path of Allah. Many a times when people make a sacrifice to Allah, Allah gives them back something better. You leave something for the sake of Allah Allah will give you back something that is better. So sometimes we will go cold turkey like in the case of uh, Sulaiman And even Umar one time he had a garden, he went to his garden, he got distracted and he missed his Salat al-Asr. And then he said, you know what, I'm going to give this in the path of Allah. And he gave the garden in the path of Allah And as a means of their Kafara or self-satisfaction. And we, what do we do when we miss our salah? Oh, it's just another one that just goes by. Salah, so I'll make it up or something someday. Allah is always to forgive us and protect us. Bisuqi wal anaq. So you can see what he did. So one thing is that he he gave up all these horses for the sake of Allah, this mode of transportation, and then what does Allah is always give him back in return? Allah gives him back the wind. We'll go, we'll go to that. Another uh, problem and test Sulaiman went through is so again with this one there's a lot of stories and opinions etc. But the one that seems to be accepted by all scholars is that one time Sulaiman he said that he's and he had a lot of wives just like his father and it was different time different norms even the king of Saudi you know in 1930s he had dozens of wives so royals and stuff it was it was different. And there's sometimes political reason why they married into different tribes. So he had a lot of wives. He, and one day he said that I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, spend time with all of my wives. And 
uh, everything, all their fruits and all the offspring uh, that come out from uh, these unions, I will give them in the path of Allah well. and I will make them soldiers for the path of Allah well. right? and uh, so some scholars say that Sayyidina did not say inshaAllah he didn't leave it and attach his will to the weak will of Allah طيب, so ولقد فتنا سليمان we tested سليمان وألقينا على كرسيه and placed on his throne his kursi جسدا a body so what is this body so scholars say that not a single wife conceived from uh, those unions and there was only one of his wives who conceived and even that conception uh, it was it was an immature and it was it was it was you know it wasn't a full uh, pregnancy and so that's the jasad the body uh, scholars say Allah is talking about here and so when Sulaiman Alaihissalam he realized what had happened you know then what did he do thumma ana right away after realizing he turned to Allah Azza wa Jalla again the same thing again and again. That they make a mistake, they turn to Allah Azza wa He said, Khala Rabbi Rufili, he said, Ya Allah, forgive me. Wahabali mulka la yambalini ahadim min ba'di. And grant me such a mulk, such a dominion, such a kingdom that no one else after me will have anything similar like it. And whatever was given to Sulaiman was not given to anyone before anyone after. And Allah Azza wa accepted his dua. He said, إِنَّكْ أَنْتَ الْوَحَابِ Ya Allah, you are the Wahhab, the one who gives the bestower. You uh, give me. He asked Allah Azza wa And then Allah says, فَسَخَّرْنَا لَهُ الْرِيحِ We subjected, subjugated, يعني, placed the wind under his service. Uh, Air Suleiman, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he, his, uh, he had the ability to control the wind. And it wasn't just a couple of people, but all his soldier, everybody used to uh, ride with him. And it wasn't like turbulence used to come and there was you know, problems in the air. Nothing like that. Rukha and it's very gentle. Haythu asab, wherever he used to want to go, the wind used to obey his command. And not only the wind Allah subjugated for him, made under the service was and the jinns all of them nine every builder from among the shayateen and the jinns was and divers they used to be under his service go build this build this castle build the city etc and they used to dive deep under waters to extract uh, jewels and rubies uh, from under the ocean okay وَآخَرِينَ مُقَرَّنِينَ فِي الْأَصْفَادِ and there were some shayateen who uh, used to not listen to Sulaiman they were, they were disobedient. And so uh, he was able to bound them together in shackles and tie them up, put them in jail, incarcerated. And he had that much authority and power. All right. So you can see that you know, even though he made a mistake, uh, in the, as we see in the Quran, that there was a couple of mistakes he made. Yet still, he was able to uh, turn around his fate by returning to Allah Azza wa Jal and crying to Allah Azza wa Jal, and then Allah Azza wa Jal gave him all this in return. Okay, and we will see the same thing again with uh, Ayub alayhi salam. Right here, we will see the same thing again. Right? <laughs> if the message isn't getting home yet, you guys listen, and it indirectly Allah is telling us. Dawood, he made a mistake, he turned to Allah. Suleiman made a mistake, he turned to Allah. Ayyub, you will see the same thing. The same thing, reinforcing in our hearts. Right? But indeed, for him, Allah said, Lazulfa, he will be very close to us, near to us. That just because some things happen, doesn't, don't ever think that Suleiman is anything below than what he deserves to be as a prophet. And you will have a very good place of return. Right? All right. Uh, how much are we on? Let me see if we should continue. I can't see the time. Um, 
All right. Uh, okay, we will do a couple of more verses and then we'll stop and shop. All right, and then comes the incident and story of uh, Ayub alayhi salam. And we talked about this recently, if you remember, but we'll go over it again. وَذْكُرْ عَبَدَنَا Ayub And mention and remember uh, our slave Ayub. And I mentioned our slave to all your followers and the Quraysh so that they can take admonishment and they can uh, remember and they can take him as a role model when it comes to bearing patience. When he called his Lord, that Shaitan has touched me with hardship, nusbin, fatigue, hardship, and some sort of torment and punishment. So, as we know, the story of Ayyub he was a prophet of Allah and he was very um, well respected in his community because of the wealth and status that he had. He had a business going, he had a lot of children, he had a lot of kids. Everything was, mashallah, going well for him. But after, at about 70 years of age, Allah tested him with a very severe and difficult uh, sickness and disease of the skin where his skin would fall off and there was, uh, you know, marks and pus and bloods everywhere. You know, this disease, until this day, a, a, a similar diseases do exist where you see people's immune system uh, is not strong and so uh, their skin start falling off, literally. You know, it starts cracking and falling off. They have to put band-aid on themselves and every six, seven hours they have to replace those bandages. May Allah Azza wa Jalla protect all of us from such uh, such trials and those who are going through these kind of trials. May Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive them and use that as a means of uh, increasing their rank in uh, in the Akhirah. So Ayub Al Salam he was going through these tests and trials and, and um, he even though going through all of that stuff he still continued to do the tasbih and remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jalla. He never stopped remembering Allah. And at that time, you know, his people took him out of the city, his people left him, his children left him. The only person that stayed by his side was his wife, who was a descendant of the family of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. So she stayed by his side and many a times she would go and make a living, do, you know, uh, many, uh, small jobs and whatever job she can find. She used to go and do that and, and bring home whatever she can for her husband, Ayub alayhi salam. And a couple of things that happened in these times. Um, one is that uh, one time she was very fed up and she was very, you know, she was looking for an answer. And she went to a, a doctor, you can say, someone who claimed to be a curer. And Shaitan uh, was, that, was that person who came and said, if you really want a cure for your husband, then say this and go slaughter an animal without the name of Allah and give it and um, he will be cured. And she was so desperate that she agreed that, hey, I found a, I, I found an answer and a solution. And so I'm going to go and do this thing. And when Ayub he found out about this, he got so hurt and and you know overtaken with his emotion that he said that if I ever get better I will I will I will hit you a hundred times I will hit you a hundred times okay so that's coming um, before that uh, he made a dua that yeah Allah I'm going through all these difficulties please make it easy for me I can't see my wife going through all this trouble so Allah said Urkut Birijlik strike the ground hit the ground with your foot. This will be a spring from which uh, cold, cool water will come. You can drink from it and your internal organs will be cured and you can wipe your body with it and your skin and everything else will get better as well. And uh, that's what happened. Allah says we gave him back his family and a like of them. And the same amount of people and children he lost, Allah gave him back that much as a mercy from him and a dhikrah as a reminder for those people who have understanding. And then here Allah says, And take in your hand a bunch of grass. 
So remember he said, I'm going to hit you a hundred times. So in order to keep the integrity of Ayub salam, that he doesn't break his oath, and at the same time keep the integrity of his wife, that she shouldn't be hit a hundred times, Allah said, just to fulfill your oath, then take a bunch of brass, a hundred of them, and you hit her with it, and that way you won't be breaking your oath. You will you will hit her a hundred times technically. Inna wajadna musabira, Allah testifies and says that we found Ayub to be a patient person, a truly a patient person after all that we have put him through. Ni'mal Abdu, what an excellent servant, what an excellent role model. Innahu Awab, just like Dawood, just like Suleiman, he was also uh, he was also uh, repeatedly, continuously turned back to Allah Azza wa Okay, inshallah. Um, this is the end of the incident with Ayub alayhi salam. Inshallah, we'll stop here. And next week we will continue. Uh, and try to finish perhaps next week or the week after. Jazakumullah khairan to everyone for joining and uh, pondering and taking a moment to reflect over the verses of the Quran. Allah Tawfiq to implement and let the Quran soak into our hearts and uh, by it may we rectify ourselves and become better human beings and ultimately better Muslims. Jazakumullah khairan inshallah. We will meet again next week. That's all I have.